Um, we, is that all right with everybody? Excellent. Um, so the obviously this is the, the whole idea behind doing this rounds is to um, help prepare people for, people for membership, and we're sort of have been just working our way through Edinburgh chapter by chapter and, and discussing it and the, the journal articles surrounding the topics as we go. But because it's actually membership exams, we've structured the last one and we will structure this one as a sort of practice exam. So the topic won't be fit and we'll sort of jump all over the place. But it's supposed to be a discussion, it's supposed to be interactive and it won't work if you guys don't, um, don't participate. So everybody welcome to chime in with their answers. And I generally pick on Max and Josh, who I know well enough to pick on. So or any newcomers, don't be nervous. <laughs> um, so just share my PowerPoint screen. I don't always do a PowerPoint. We try and keep it sort of casual and low um, input from me, <laughs> usually. Um, but obviously, practice exam, this is similar to the format that you'll get in the membership. So we'll see how we go. Um, all right, are you happy if we start? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, it's not question three, it's question one. Uh, a three-year-old male neutered French bulldog presents to you with a six week history of large volume, infrequent diarrhea, three to four times per day with no tenesmus or mucus observed. The owners report intermittent vomiting and marked anorexia. The dog has had a few milder, shorter episodes which resolved spontaneously throughout the rest of its life. The diarrhea was acute in onset with no historical dietary indiscretion or change in diet. The initial biochemistry and hematology are shown. There we go, shown here. Now, can everyone see them all right? On their screen? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Excellent. So this is really similar to what you get in a practice, in a, um, not a practice exam, in, a, in an oral exam. They'll kind of, first question will be a gimme. So you're allowed to take notes in the exam. So when they're going through signalment and the historical problems and things, it's good to just note down the, um, the things that you think are significant or the problem like write a, pro a rolling problem list as you go and then the first question will often be something like write a problem list or you know something what are the what are the abnormalities noted here so usually a bit of a gimme so does somebody want to just start a problem problem list and i'll tick them off as we go well they do that uh, what does um MPV, PDW, and PCT mean? MPV is mean platelet volume. PDW is platelet distribution width. And PCT is the platelet crit. So what percentage of the blood volume is platelet? Come on, problem list is a gimme. Oh, okay. Um, so there is a um, low normal red blood, uh, vomiting, sorry, diarrhea of six week onset. Do we do the history problem list as well? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then previous history of diarrhea that had self resolved. Mm -hmm. um, there is a low normal um, hematocrit with a small amount of regeneration. Mm -hmm. um, there's a neutrophilia with so there's a leukocytosis um with a quite a marked neutrophilia Good. um uh sorry i'm on my phone um increased platelet is that how you say it something like that yep um and eosinophilopenia um low creatinine uh, pan hyperprotonemia, hypocalcemia, and a hypercholesterolemia. Excellent. 
full marks. Well done. <laughs> I got did the she, one. Did she <laughs> just say di one. diarrhea or small bowel diarrhea? Oh, good point, actually. She said diarrhea. <laughs> small bowel diarrhea. So 3.75 out of four marks then. <laughs> Um, no, that's a, and that's a really good observation that the information you're given in that initial slide it often has a lot of hints in it. So the signalment might be a hint. The um, uh, like if they give you information, it means something. So I yeah. said specifically, no mucus, no tenesmus, and um, uh, what else did I say? Infrequent large volume which are all specific for um, small intestinal. Okay. So now obviously there's a lot of possible causes of this dog's gastrointestinal signs. And actually in an oral exam, you won't be asked to write a list. So I apologize for this. This is sort of extrapolated from a practical exam I did with a fellowship candidate. Um, but do you want to just go straight to 3C, which is listed diagnostic plan for this dog? Okay, um, so I'd start with a full physical examination mm -hmm. um, and paying particular attention to um, abdominal palpation and weight changes, mm -hmm. um, checking the temperature. Um, there's a potential for um, like a hyperbrishemia, well, there's hyperbrishemia and it may, maybe that there's been a bit of blood loss as well. So also just checking um, hydration status and um, perfusion as well through mm -hmm. mucous membrane, CRT, skin tinting. Um, following on from that, the blood test, the initial blood tests have already been done. Um, I would run some additional, oh, I'd do a rectal exam as well and have a look at the feces, checking for Molina. Um, and I'd probably do a fecal float in-house and then send off for um, a laboratory fecal float and potentially a PCR looking for um, diseases. Do I need to say all of them? No, 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 no. no? That's okay. Right, cool. right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, following on from that, I'd also run a, uh, I'd send off for a, um, cabalamin and a trypsin-like amino reactivity um, and look at doing a full abdominal ultrasound. Can I have those results or awesome. do I need to keep going? Yeah. Um, no, I think that's a really, that's perfect approach um, to the initial diagnostic plan for sure. Um, there's one test that I wanted you to say that you didn't. Anybody else want to jump in? An abdominal ultrasound? She, she actually did say ultrasound. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, a cortisol level, baseline cortisol. Excellent. I, um, Thank you. Good. Just put it on your list, list for everything. <laughs> um, do you just want to do a baseline or like we're not, we're not being careful with finances? Uh, if we're sending it, yeah, full stem. I would do a full stem. Excellent. Um, so this is really tricky because I'm going to say to you, just think about what you do in the clinic because it makes you relax. But then actually in the clinic, you tend to be a little bit more conservative with people's finances. Whereas in this like fantasy situation, you're obviously not going to hold back on your testing. So ACTH seems good. And the other thing that was on our problem list that we haven't clarified further is this. What do we want to do? Uh, you could do an ionized calcium. Great. But it, it's probably low because it's got hypoalbuminemia. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. It's probably a furphy. Um, but I would, because hypocalcemia can cause gastrointestinal upset. So, for example, like a primary hypoparathyroidism, which is so yeah. rare, will often present with gastrointestinal signs. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's excellent. Well done. So ACTH stimulation test reveals Addison's disease. What is this patient's prognosis? 
good with treatment. Mm. Yep, excellent. <laughs> good. How are you going to treat this this patient in particular? Um, can you, can I go back to the bloods? Yeah, of course. Is that okay? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the sodium potassium ratio is okay at the moment. So it's probably at the moment an atypical Addisonian, mm -hmm. um, meaning that it may not need mineral or corticoid supplementation currently. Yeah. Um, so you could start with just a glucocorticoid supplementation like portate um, or prednisolone, um, but then monitor the um, electrolytes frequently, like maybe in a couple of, like two weeks time Good. and then a month and then every three months after that to assess whether or not it's going to develop full Addison, Addison's disease. Excellent. Good. My understanding, and correct it if it's wrong, is that um, the glucocorticoid Addisonians very rarely become mineral or corticoid uh, within the first year anyway. It's a slow progress, yeah. Um, what on this blood test is very atypical in an Addisonian? It's for the the eosinopenia. Eosinopenia, <laughs> absolutely, and a raging neutrophilia, which you can't mount without cortisol. So this is, this is not, this is such a bad exam question. So uh, this is just sort of for discussion now, like you've got all the, all the points and you did really well with the um, treatment and prognosis and all of that stuff. Um, so the, these blood tests aren't actually an Addisonian dog, um, but they mimic very closely a dog that I've seen with really similar presenting signs. So the thing with Addison's is that often they, you tip them into a crisis or their Addison's becomes kind of overtly evident when there's a concurrent illness. So there's an increased demand for cortisol within the body. So this dog is Addisonian, but it's probably actually got something else going on as well. So Addison's disease can certainly cause a hypoproteinemia due to a protein losing enteropathy. And that's it's an uncommon presentation, but certainly reported. Um, but with these blood changes, I would say something had to have caused that neutrophilia before the cortisol ran out. So I would clinically probably do a broader investigation in this dog uh, as to potentially if there's sepsis or something like that going on somewhere else. These blood tests are actually a dog with um, P, um, lymphangiectasia. Okay, so that's the worst question of the bunch. And I didn't do that one last week because I hate it. So well done, everybody to get through that. Okay, question two. A four-year-old wolfhound presents to you with exercise intolerance. On physical examination, the heart rate is 200 and the rhythm is irregularly irregular with pulse deficits, which I should have specified in that text. Describe the ECG findings here. Well, there's an irregular, irregular heart rate um, and an undulating P wave. Um, QRS morphology otherwise looks normal and there's tachycardia. Excellent. So I'd say atrial fib. Excellent. Fantastic. Is everybody any questions on that or any, anything in addition to that? Um, does every P have a QRS complex attached with it? The sort of one a third of the way across. So are you looking at this one maybe? Yeah. 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 And the one before that as well. And here. Um, or here. Yeah, there as well. So I think we've probably got um, fluctuation of the um, so I think these are probably all P's. Um, so I can't actually, I would say that there is not a QRS complex for the visible P waves, but I would say that I can't really distinguish obvious P waves. 
in there. They're kind of all sitting on top of each other rather than being nicely kind of laid out on a flat baseline. Could uh, the atrial fib be firing off the atrium, but the the AV node hasn't um, what's the term recharged itself, so it, it can't. It's it's uh, late and quiescent until it does. Absolutely. So um, that conduction through that AV node and ventricular depolarization depends on the ventricles being repolarized before they can be set off again. So the atria are firing really quickly, but the ventricles can only fire at a certain rate before they're ready to go again. So as many signals as can get through the AV node are getting through, um, but there's certainly more P waves to QRSs. Is everyone happy with that? You got full marks. That's that was the four things that if the, if there is an atrial fibrillation trace, I want you to mention that there's a high heart rate, that there's normal QRS morphology, that the RR interval is irregular, which you you said in a different way, but that's the sort of the way that ideally we'd say it, um, and that there's no P waves visible or undulating baseline. All right, so you've got the, what is your diagnosis? What other diagnostic tests would you perform in this patient? Echocardiogram. Great. To look at contractility and the size of the heart. Excellent. And my diagnosis would most likely be DCM. Good. Any other diagnostic tests you want to do? Thoracic radiographs. Excellent. Uh, electrolyte. Excellent. Good. Good blood pressure. Excellent. <laughs> Leading. What? What is sort of an emerging cause of DCM at the moment? Oh, taurine levels. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Do we want to do a pro B and P in this patient? For an exam question, probably yes, maybe, but realistically, you'd probably just rely more on the echo. Absolutely. And what's that? Is our pro B and P going to be elevated? I mean, this dog's got heart disease. Yeah, probably. If it's. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't, if I was an examiner, I have it in my answer key, but I probably wouldn't allocate a point to it. Like it's something that it's certainly not the wrong thing to do, but it's it's almost not going to give us any more information than we're already getting with the diagnostic tests we're performing. Um, and the other thing I want to do is, oh, should I push you or should I just tell you? Push. Push. <laughs> So all we've done is electrolytes in this patient. Four-year-old dog with AS. Why has a four-year-old dog got AS? Like, uh, we should do a complete blood count to see if there's any like infectious, like endocarditis Excellent. type disease. Good, very good. And what else can give you a hint of systemic inflammatory disease? What other tests? CRP? Yeah. CRP, good one. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, that was a kind of a trick question. Um, given that this dog may be needing treatment with fruzamide and things, do we do we want to check biochem maybe? Yeah. Yeah, check kidney function. What else might we want to check with kidney function? Urine analysis. Great. I would say if you're ever asked what diagnostic test would you like to perform, biochem, hematology, urinalysis, just put it on the list. Mm. Don't miss the easy marks. Um, and there's one other thing that I would do in this patient, super rare, um, but hypothyroidism can cause AF, lone AF in the absence of um, any structural heart disease. 
So I would definitely want to do a T4, just total T4 in this patient. Okay, <clears throat> an echocardiogram revealed no structural heart disease. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I just realized my computer's been like slowly creeping towards me, slipping off my desk. <laughs> Sorry. Um, an echocardiogram revealed no structural heart disease underlying atrial fibrillation. Did this, what is your treatment plan for this patient? Um, to control the arrhythmia. Um, so in this one, I'd probably use a diltiazem, a calcium channel blocker. Mm -hmm. um, do we know if that, like, was it, if there was any kind of, if it was hypothyroid or is it? Um, um, it there was no other abnormalities. It was just the only thing wrong with this patient is AF. Yeah, I probably just uh, start to tie them and maybe start supplementing taurine at the same time. Great. Excellent. Um, would you, are there any other medications? So you start your diltiazem and you do a heart rate check a week later in this patient and the heart rate remains above 160. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I was saying I'd, I'd want to max out the diltiazem first. Mm -hmm. If we're still um, not getting a heart rate under 160, then you can look at adding in digoxin. Good. Excellent. Are there any other ways that we can treat, um, we can achieve rate control? Like beta blockers as well, I think. Good. Can, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, most of the papers show that diltiazem and digoxin combined are the most effective treatment for rate control. Um, has anybody heard of a more definitive way of treating AF in patients that don't have underlying heart disease? You can do like a, um, you can stop the re-entry circuit um, with like, I think it's like a heat thing where you find it and then you zap it, something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's Sorry, my, my dad had it, but I can't remember what it is. There's radio catheter ablation, which you, we can say yeah. SVT, so superventricular oh, okay. um, yeah. uh, When I say we can certainly do, it's, we can't, I mean, can't. Rita can, but we can't. But the other thing you can actually do with AF is you can defibrillate them. Okay. And it just stops the atrial fibrillation in theory. My uh, sister had that under propofol. Oh, really? At like age 30 on vacation. Oh my gosh, that's so traumatic. But it worked on the first try. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, did she have any underlying reason to go into AF? She's had it twice under like the age of 35 and the cardiologist said no treatment is warranted. Yeah. No underlying reason is found. Okay. Good. Just get zapped. Just get zapped. Yeah. In dogs, they can't give them any sedation because it, they just it impacts the outcome. No, sorry, they get midazolam, but they're not allowed to be completely anesthetized. Um, and apparently it's quite a, an awful thing to watch, but quite an effective way of treating AF, particularly in such a young dog that um, would be a medication for the rest of its life otherwise. Um, wolfhounds in particular get a certain type of AF. Has anybody heard, is that ringing any bells for anybody? Yes. Is it the Wolf Parkinson one? Oh, or is um, that something else? No, it's not. That's a Labrador thing. Actually. Oh, right. Wolf Parkinson <laughs> is the um, supraventricular tachycardia. All oh, right. Of which AF is a supraventricular tachycardia, but it's not. Um, it's not the Wolf Parkinson white one. Is, so the way I remember this, wolfhounds get lone atrial fibrillation which just means there's no real cause for it apart from that they've got high vagal tone and they've got really big left atria just owing to their size of their hearts. Um, so it's called lone AF and the way I remember it is lone wolf. Um, and it's treated exactly the same way, um, but it's just essentially if I see a wolfhound with AF that's otherwise healthy on other testing, I'm, I'm not very worried about it basically. 
Um, it's got a normal life expectancy, theoretically, if we can control his heart rate. So would you not take the risk to defibrillate it then? Or you still um, would? Uh, I probably would, actually. Yeah. 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 Because it's still going to be making it feel um, weak. Yeah. And in reality, I'm going to refer it to Rita. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on my own. <laughs> um, okay. So for anybody that doesn't know, Rita is our cardiologist that we work with. So I'm very spoiled to have a cardiologist to refer to. Um, so next question is, how would this differ if there had been DCM? So if there was severe left atrium regularly, associated with DCM and there was evidence of congestive heart failure at the time of diagnosis. How would your treatment change? You'd include pimibendin and furuzamide of this congestive heart failure. Okay, exactly. Very good. And that's all I was after in that question. So you don't need to go into any more detail than that, but um, you covered the main thing I wanted to get out of there is that you don't you need to look for underlying structural heart disease um, as a cause of AF. Right, next question. Seven-year-old German Shepherd dog presents collapsed with pale mucous membranes, tachycardia, and a fluid wave in the abdomen. First question is describe your initial diagnostic approach for this patient. And your second question is going to be your initial stabilization approach. So try and separate out your responses if you can. So let's go with initial diagnostic approach for this patient. Like a physical examination and history to start with. Yeah. Get into any toxin leaving environment uh, and then I'll start physical examination mm -hmm. um, uh, do a blood pressure um, and I'll do some blood tests and then go for imaging uh, in terms of blood tests I'll be looking at like a pack cell volume and total protein right. um, electrolyte uh, if we have enough time we do it biochemistry and, and cbc in total like a complete picture yeah and then i'll be going for like uh abdominal ultrasound to see why there's a fluid wave there mm -hmm. and uh maybe do a clotting time before i do a uh, abdominal synthesis uh, to see what's of fluid and now start doing fluid analysis mm -hmm. and depends on what we find on ultrasound uh, we might need to do some uh, FNA or biopsy. Um, I think that's the initial approach. Good. You're taking bloods without urine, but I can't see the urine being a problem though. Yeah, it's difficult in an emergency situation. I've, I've got written down in my answer key urine, but I've got zero marks next to it. Like it's definitely not the wrong thing to do, but clinically, it's not a priority in this patient. Um, uh, there's one thing. You miss one mark there, um, which is not a big deal. Like you definitely got most of the marks there. Um, I think I'll do a, a ultrasound the heart to see if there's any pericardial effusion. Good boy, thank you. Because this patient's presented with pale mucous membranes, tachycardia, and a fluid wave, we could actually be dealing with poor perfusion and right side of congestive failure as well. Heart wound test, depending on the dog's geography and uh, prevention, mm -hmm. uh, could be a thought, could it? Uh, prevention, like heartworm. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really good point. Awesome. All right. Now, next question is describe your initial stabilization approach to this patient. I think uh, this patient uh, in shock because it's collapsed uh, with pale mucous membrane and tachycardia. Mm -hmm. 
uh, then I will start giving a uh, bolus of fluid, uh, 90 mil, 90 mil per kilo uh, bolus, uh, and see the response of the tachycardia or the mentation. Um, and if there is pericardial effusion, then I think we need to, and if the APTD and PD normal, then we might need to do a, a pericardial synthesis. Um, if it is uh, because of right side of heart failure or from DCM, then might need to add on people bending. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is a, a, a bleeding tumor in the abdomen, then uh, I think after fluid resuscitation, we might need to consider some sort of blood product um, for blood transfusion. Uh, if the blood pressure is still poor, then I think I'll be adding on some like facial vasopressor, like you no know, adrenaline or dopamine. Uh, I think that that's all we're doing yeah, initially. That's, that's really reasonable without knowing what the fluid is. Um, so the only thing we haven't talked about is pain relief. We haven't asked whether the dog was painful on physical exam. So that's something with initial stabilization, they'll usually be after like pain management. Um, so just mention it. What would you choose? So the dog was tense on abdominal palpation, um, indicating and with a pain score of 15 out of 24. Um, what pain relief would you choose for this patient? Maybe fentanyl because it's you can titrate it and it's very short acting Good. in case it did increase its um, shock. Excellent. Is there any other reason that's a, an excellent choice? There's another reason why it's an excellent choice. In case it goes to surgery. Perfect. Excellent. So you don't want to use something like butorphanol, which is going to limit your ability to use pain relief, other types of pain relief if it goes to surgery. Um, excellent. Okay. With um, the fluid therapy, you said 90 mils a kilo, but you didn't specify <clears throat> per hour. But mm. I notice a lot of the emergency people will divide that into 10 minute lots. Mm. And certainly in my experience with dealing with paro uh, puppies, you, you, you rarely get to 90 mils a kilo. Mm. Usually somewhere around about 40, 45 mils per kilo would, would bring them around. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is you can set the timer on your uh, on your pumps, and it, it doesn't tie a, um, a nurse or a vet up. Yeah. Um, uh, on a one-on-one on -one -on -one basis, they they've got time to go and look at other things while that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly if you've got other emergencies coming out of your ears, which does happen, doesn't it? Um. So an A fast is performed. Can someone describe the appearance of this spleen or this mass lesion, which was identified in the spleen? Um, it's heteroechoic uh, with areas of hypoechoic uh, lesions, I guess. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and irregular borders. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good. Perfect. Um, list three differential diagnoses in order of likelihood. Sorry, I should have said the abdominocentesis was blood. List three differential diagnoses in order of likelihood for these changes. Hemangiosarcoma, um, hemangioma. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a third one. Hematoma. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Um, so essentially there's very benign possible causes of this. The breed and appearance of it ultrasonographically would make me concerned about malignancy in this dog. And there's not that many tumours that end up as cystic as this. So hemangiosarcoma. Obviously, it's a tumour of the blood vessel wall, which decreases the stability of those blood vessels and causes little microbleeds throughout the tumour itself. 
So this is a very concerning appearance of a tumour for me, particularly in the presence of a heme abdomen. So this patient went to surgery, a splenectomy was performed, and after surgery, the patient's recovering well clinically. However, an arrhythmia is noted on physical examination. The blood pressure remains stable, and despite the arrhythmia and pulse deficits, the heart rate is 140, and the blood pressure is within normal limits. Describe the ECG findings below. We have abnormal QRS complexes. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of wide and bizarre. And then it looks like we have a few normal in the middle mm -hmm. um, where I can see P, QRS and T waves. Um, mm -hmm. So premature ventricular complexes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, can you tell me which ventricle they're arising in and which side of the heart they're arising in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about that one. Can I tell you how? Oh, can somebody else tell? Who have I got there? It's not Alison, is it? Alice. Alice, B. Pattern, sorry. Um, uh, can somebody tell us how you recognise which side of the heart a VPC arises from? If the first deflection is down, it's right-sided, I think. Uh, if the first deflection is up, it's left-sided. Oh, other way around, Jeff. Do you want me to tell you how I remember it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> left is lower. So if it arises on the left, it goes down first before it goes up. If it arises on the right, it goes up first before it goes down. So we've got left ventricular VPCs. What is the name of this arrhythmia where there's runs of VPCs with a, a low heart rate? Like an idioventricular rhythm. Excellent. Very good. Do you need to do anything about it? Not if the heart rate is, uh, well, someone's, well, people said if the heart rate is below 180, you don't need to, and the blood pressure is normal, mm -hmm. then you don't need to do anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what other conditions do we see this arrhythmia in most commonly? Uh, abdominal disease yeah. or uh, some sort of perfusion problem. Good, excellent. Um, so typically abdominal disease, probably post-op GDV is the most common time that we'll see this. So if the heart rate is above 160 or 180, depending on which reference you look at, and the blood pressure is low, then we would call this ventricular tachycardia. And we would probably treat this with... Lindokine? Yes, exactly. So this question could have gone either way. So we could have, I could have put a picture of ventricular tachycardia up there, in which case the answer would be a lignocaine bolus and infusion. Any questions on that one? Is it still true that uh, if the splenic tumor is not bleeding, 50% mm -hmm. of the time are benign and 50% then it's malignant? And if it's bleeding, then it's two third and one third? That's, that's a, a sum, very loose summary of all of the data that we have. Um, so certainly that's true when you kind of look at broad categories, but then when you sort of subdivide those that had cystic appearance, the masses that had cystic appearance on ultrasound, I think we'd probably end up with more of those being malignant. That was a picture of a hemangiosarcoma. All right, so next question or any, any more questions on that one? Right, next question. A nine-year-old female neutered domestic short hair presents to you with a two-day history of all of a sudden being unable to jump onto the bench and regurgitating after eating dry food. On examination, the patient appears to have diffuse weakness with normal body condition and physical examination findings. 
Describe your diagnostic approach to this patient. I do a full um, physical exam, fundic exam, tick search and um, electrolytes and biochem, CBC, urine, neurologic exam. And that's probably all I would do to start with. Awesome. Um, Good history is always important and asking if there's any tick prevention and where's the cat and the owner's been in the last week. Good, excellent. Um, what are you looking for in where where the cat where's the cat been in the last week? Outside. Outside. Yes, that's Who right. The cat? the cat or the owners. Yeah. Um, are there any specific questions you'd ask about their environment? Do they live in Central Australia or along the east coast? Good. Why? You don't get sick in Central Australia. Yeah, right. Okay. So that's something <laughs> we need to ask your examiner. Where is the clinic that yeah. I went in? Yeah. Um, uh, is there anything maybe, that, that you've had it? Don't know. I was just saying, maybe you do. I'm not sure. I'm just assuming you don't. <laughs> no. Maybe um, um, if it's fed raw fish, it could be like a thiamine deficiency. Excellent. Postal. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thiamin or oh, these thiamin, sorry. I, was, I always get thiamin and taurine confused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, good. Uh, and there's another environmental thing. Um, so say the owner says, oh, yeah, our house backs onto the national park. We've got bush all around us. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Excellent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Good. Now back to the biochem. Is there anything, and this is your examiner will prompt you, like if you've said biochem and they want more information, they'll ask you the question. Um, so is there anything in particular that you're interested in in your biochemical analysis? The electrolytes? Is, yeah, somebody. The potassium in particular. Excellent. Great. CK, I think so yeah. Uh, glucose, very good. And Max, you said CK. Excellent. And? AST. Excellent. Very good. One more. Did someone say potassium? Yeah, Josh said potassium. Calcium. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Um, what are we looking for in our CBC? Anemia. Excellent. Very good. So it could certainly be a cause of weakness in this patient and the regurgitation un unrelated. Excellent. So um, there is no historical access to... Um, Toxins, there is a normal balanced diet. On neurological examination, our palpebral reflex fatigues over time, so it's normal at first and then gets slower and incomplete. The cat can walk normally for the first few steps and then sits. And proprioception is normal. Um, what other diagnostic tests do you want to do? Oh, and sorry, the biochem, biochem and CBC are normal also. Acetylcholine receptor antibody test and a thoracic radiograph. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Your thoracic radiographs were performed. Describe the changes here. The megaesophagus. Right. Got the uh, increased opacity in the cranial thorax. Good. 
I think it's cranial median sternum. Mm -hmm. uh, got an increased opacity of the left caudal lung lobe on the VD view. Um, I think it has got generalized mild interstitial pattern of the lung. Other than that, there's no fractures that I can see. There's no pneumo, no suggestion of pneumothorax. Uh, there's no foreign body I can see. Good. Can anyone comment on the airways? Well, give me a bit, little bit more information on the um, increased opacity in the cranial mediastinum. Increased opacity, but normal size, shape. I'll say increased size, a round shape. Yeah. It could be a mass there. Mm -hmm. Would it be a foam over? We'd have to do more testing, but let's keep talking about the radiographs. Um, would, you say, would you say there's widening of the mediastinum? On I would, yeah, on the VD. That's an excellent way of describing it. So increased opacity is good. It's definitely true. But I want more, like I said, more information <laughs> we can get out of here. The trachea is deviated to the right. Right. Excellent. And on the lateral? Dorsally mm -hmm. elevated. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So it shouldn't be sitting right at the top of the thoracic inlet. It should be sitting kind of at least sort of two thirds of the way down. I mean, a third of the way down. Good, so that's everything on the thoracic radiographs I wanted you to point out. What is your leading diagnosis for the weakness and regurgitation now? The mycenae gravis. Great, excellent. Does everybody know why? Well, I'm just gonna make Max tell us why now. Uh, I think I'll just vaguely remember this thymoma and to produce antibody attacking the ACL receptor on mus uh, neuromuscular junction. Excellent. Very good. So myasthenia gravis is associated with thymoma. Um, I don't really know why, but it's just um, theoretically dysregulated lymphocytes will trigger dysregulated antibody production and um be predisposed to autoimmune disease and in thymoma it tends to manifest as um, myasthenia so antibodies towards the acetylcholine receptors on the muscle so at the junction of the nerve and the muscle neuromuscular junction um so josh mentioned test earlier for myasthenia are there any other testing tests we could before, or can can anybody else tell me what test that was? That, what that test was? The it's one, a, it's the a one. test for antibodies against um, the acetylcholine receptors of the neuromuscular junction. Um, you could also do like a neostigmine right. um, response right. test with this cat. Excellent. Um, and I probably also want to try and get samples of that mass just out of interest so maybe an fna if coags are fine yep excellent um so i'm assuming ultrasound guided fna sorry what was that i'm assuming ultrasound guided fna oh always ultrasound guided yes. <laughs> always sorry i should say that yeah you should definitely say that <laughs> um so how likely are you to get a diagnosis of thymoma on cytology i think that's probably quite quite well around cell tumors in general, so probably likely. Um, yep. You could also try and get, um, if we can get enough of an aspirate, we could do the flow cytometry as well. Very good. So what's that that the other leading differential for um, this cranial mediastinal mass in cats? Like lymphoma? Exactly. 
Um, so we often have trouble differentiating lymphoma and thymoma cytologically because they're both just lymphocytes. Um, thymomas tend to have increased epithelial cells, but they often come back inconclusive. So if you're getting samples, I would get enough for flow cytometry as well, as long as there's no contraindication for, you know, we haven't caused a bleed with the first sample or something like that. I would keep going until we've got enough cells. Presuming our patient is sedated, we don't want to have to do that again. Um, now, that is probably, that's all the tests I had written down um, on this patient. Does anybody have any questions about this one? Um, I have a question yeah. about, I read online last night, very, very briefly, because it was late and didn't look into it further, but methimazole causing myasthenia gravis, is that actually a thing? I've never heard of that. Okay. Was this in my <laughs> client forum or was this in the science? It was on um, clinician's brief. Oh, interesting. Through it, saw it, was like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to go to bed now. <laughs> um, oh, and that's really interesting. They were talking about that, but I, I really didn't look into it further. So <laughs> sure. What was that? <laughs> Is that a dog or someone's belly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, that was my dog's there fighting. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's really interesting, Alex. I might have to look into that, but I wouldn't put that in my answer key if I was examining membership. <laughs> okay. Um, um, obviously, because I didn't even know about it. <laughs> in terms of testing, is there a difference between using Tensilin or the Endrophonium versus the Neostigmin? Um, yes, so tensilon and edrophonium are theoretically um, more likely to get a response. Yeah. Um, neostigmine is easier to come by. Edrophonium is really hard to source. I see, yeah. So sometimes we have to do neostigmine. Um, neostigmine we often give as an infusion in hospital for patients that are, for example, like just regurgitating profoundly and we can't get them to keep food down and we need to wait till like an oral medication. We have to stabilize them enough to be candidates for oral pyridostigmine. Um, and we use a neostigmine infusion in hospital just to stabilize them and get them eating again. Yeah. Um, so it's better for acute management of a crisis rather than diagnosis. But with, we have been had to use neostigmine as a trial. Yeah. It's not as a, acute an onset in improvement because- Yeah. yeah. Thanks. No worries. Um, yeah, I wouldn't expect at a membership level, you guys, to, I wouldn't ask you what, um, how to treat it or anything like that. I think the NIST the immune response test is a, a good um, good enough answer sort of thing or um, edrophonic response test. Um, so I don't think we've got time for the next question. Does anybody have anything, any questions or anything? Any exam anxieties they want to share? Who have we got? How many have we got sitting? Matt's doing mine on Monday. You're doing yours on Monday and Josh's Tuesday? Mine's Sunday. Oh, Sunday. Oh, Sunday. That's right. That's right. That's right. You Monday, Max. I didn't know that. Yeah, Monday, 21st. All right, so I can't talk to you until after Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. It's a scary on document, legal document. Is it by Zoom? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Um, Lauren, when are you? On Monday as well. Monday, yeah. Excellent. All right, well, good luck, guys. If you think of any questions, flick me an email. Um, and anybody needing, yeah, any extra um, oral exam tests, we've probably run out of time for Liz to run through it. But um, you guys will all be fine. Give yourself a weekend off studying so that your brain is nice and fresh. Cool. Thank Thanks you. so much, Anna. Thank you. Thank you.